Hi, I'm Stephanie Metz. Welcome to the video version of the Artist Talk for In Touch, my exhibition of multiple, human-sized, touchable, hands-on sculptures made of wool and felt. In Touch made its debut at the De Sassé Museum on the campus of Santa Clara University, where today's talk was meant to be held. I do wish we could all be together there right now so you could see and feel the art for yourself, but these are strange times. As I'm recording this, we're a month and a half into sheltering in place in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and I'm coming to you today from my home studio here in San Jose, California. In Touch is all about connecting with others through the shared experience of interacting with highly tactile artwork in person, so the cosmic timing of this show ended up being pretty off. This is an unprecedented situation, and I know we're all dealing with grief, loss, and uncertainty in our lives in different ways. For me, the premature closure of In Touch was a huge disappointment. After two years of hard work making and planning and involving my community in this ambitious project, it was hard to see the planned six month long show close after just eight weeks. I really hoped more people could come see it in person. I'll admit I did some wallowing in self pity, but I've mostly made peace with it. It helps that the past two years, the experience of making the work has been such a fantastic one. The shortening of the exhibition hasn't taken away from that. I also find it helps put things in perspective when I consider sheltering in place to be a collective, gigantic act of caring for the vulnerable in our community. We don't know what's coming next, but then again, we never know what's coming next. I am confident that we humans will continue to be creatures of touch, connection, and wonder, and we'll keep finding ways to experience and share that. In Touch will find another venue. I'm confident of that as well. For now, this virtual experience will have to do. I was really excited to do an artist talk in large part to shine a light on all the people who helped bring this project to life. From the fantastic staff at the De Sassé Museum, to the hands-on volunteers, studio assistants, and supporters of In Touch, and my family. This project represents a lot of firsts for me, bringing helpers into my studio, trying new methods of construction, fundraising, and, of course, inviting visitors to handle the art. I get a lot of questions about all of that, so I figured I'd make my talk into a video that would answer a lot of it. I'm going to show and tell you about felt, my work, the idea for InTouch, the process of bringing this huge project to fruition, and I'll share some of the images of the fun results. So, here we go. I've been creating sculpture out of wool since 2002. I use specialized tools to shape it into felt, which is basically a non-woven textile. I'm going to give you a very brief rundown of how wool is turned into felt so you'll have some understanding of what I do and what my helpers did for this project. It starts, of course, with sheep. After they're shorn, the wool is washed, separated, brushed, and prepared for different uses. For felting, you can use roving, where all the fibers are arranged in the same direction like a fluffy rope, or batting, where they're going in all different directions in loose sheets. This is what I use for InTouch. Wool fibers felt or tangle together and hold tight thanks to their structure. Under a microscope, you'll see the fibers are covered in overlapping scales. When the fibers are forced together, those scales grab onto each other and interlock. You can make that process happen through wet felting or needle felting. In wet felting, you arrange your fibers, then add hot water, soap, and lots of motion to tangle and compress the fibers. In my very limited experience, wet felting is good for garments, flat and hollow forms, and sculpture, but I create three-dimensional sculpture through needle felting. Felting needles were developed for use in factories to make flat sheets of felt by mechanically tangling fibers. The sharp end of the shaft has notches cut along it that you can hardly see, yet those notches are enough to push and interlock the fibers with their neighbors. In a factory, wool would be fed into a machine between hundreds of needles and their matching holes so that when the machine goes up and down, the fibers are poked, tangled, and compressed into even flat sheets. A longer time in the machine means denser, more compacted felt. I do the same thing by hand, but I work in the round, meaning I work from all different directions. Poking inwards from all sides makes a sphere. Poking repeatedly in one spot makes a hole. Poking in a line makes a crevice. I make complicated forms by making simple forms and joining them together. I poke through one piece into another and add on more wool and poke that in. The technique of needle felting is really quite simple, but it sure helps to have a ton of patience. And I also have a background in sculpture using other materials and that translates pretty well. In college I studied traditional figurative anatomy and mostly used clay and stone, with some metalsmithing thrown in too. 
I avoided the fibers department completely. I was already combining recognizable forms with fantastic abstractions, but I hadn't really found my voice. When I stumbled across needle felting several years after college, I started right in with a familiar human figure. A lot of my early felt work was more about seeing what I could do with wool, trying to make it look solid and heavy like the more traditional hard sculptural materials of wood, metal, and stone. I taught myself how to create internal support armatures for standing figures, and how to make swelling curves as well as clean lines, angles, and ridges. I started to realize I could use felt to represent hard and soft parts, fur, flesh, and bone. After I'd made this sheep skull, it simply made sense that a stuffed animal skull would be made out of firm but pliable felt too. My Teddy Bear Unnatural History series really married together my material with my subject in a very fitting way. I stopped trying to make felt be like something else and embraced that it was the perfect medium for exploring themes that felt right to me, loosely centered around the complicated relationship between humans and the natural world. After all, teddy bears are a man-made fantasy about an apex predator. From examples of domestication taken to ridiculous extremes, to forms that seem to straddle the line between creature and sculpture, my work became increasingly abstract. I started incorporating other materials, from different types of hair, to metal mesh, to porcupine quills. I like the push and pull of opposites, soft and hard, alluring and dangerous. I get to play off the unique physical qualities of wool. I explored ways to work larger, so the viewer's whole body would be involved in moving around the work. Even though the forms I create are only vaguely familiar, I work to make them seem believable and real. Through it all, viewers have been drawn in by the mysterious, beckoning warmth of the felt, yet tortured by being forbidden to touch. And then, that changed. The origin of InTouch was actually politics. That is, I come from a politically divided family, and while that's not unusual, it's very painful to feel so at odds with people that you love. I was feeling overwhelmed and saddened by division and discord in my personal life and locally and nationally and globally. And I know a lot of artists whose response is to make art about such things, but I didn't want to pour all my energy into the negative. I wanted to focus on what I want more of in my life, a sense of connection and a way to see the commonalities that unite us despite our differences, a feeling of engagement, curiosity, wonder that speaks across those differences. And I thought, okay, well, what can I do? I'm not a politician, I'm not a leader or a speaker or a writer. My trade is in making sculpture using this weird material and technique. And then that was it. I realized I've seen the same response over and over again over the years. I'd be at exhibition openings, and there'd be people hovering near my work, dying to touch it because it looks so intriguingly touchable. And sometimes I'd say, oh, you know, I'm the artist. If your hands are clean, you can touch it with my permission. And the reaction was usually pretty wonderful. They'd turn to their neighbor with, surprise and glee and exclaim over it. And I realized that it wasn't always the person they came with, it might be a total stranger. And the experience of engaging with my work was what was causing people to have a connection. That was a real aha moment for me, that this unique medium that I work in has the potential to connect people through the experience of its, its very nature. And that was the kernel for In Touch. I thought, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make more of this and make it bigger and really engage people in a, in a whole body way to encounter the people and the objects around them and be very present and alive and, and connect. And so, I got to work. I developed some ideas for sculptural forms that would encourage interaction and settled on two main concepts. The first was hanging sculptures that visitors could move among and touch. I started figuring out details on the visual and tactile effects I wanted, the materials and construction techniques, the shapes in nature that inspired me, and the budget, given the size and quantity of components. These hanging pods, as I came to call them, would be covered in sculpted white felt for a variety of visually and physically rewarding experiences. I created a concept drawing to communicate the idea to potential venues, and I prepared examples of sculpture for which I'd used a similar approach. The second idea called for multiple large, lightweight sculptures that people could move and rearrange for full physical interaction. I knew I wanted these pieces to be more geometric, and I'd use similar construction techniques as the hanging pieces. Except for these, the joining and stitching would need to be really clean and tidy since it wouldn't be hidden by a layer of white wool. I created a concept drawing for these holdables, made some prototypes, and recruited my sons to try them out and model for me. 
I started putting out feelers for ideal local venues and set up a studio visit with the director and assistant director from the De Sassé Museum at Santa Clara University. I had a previous connection with them and the museum after having exhibited work in group shows there. It's a beautiful space and they had expressed interest in my touchable sculpture idea. I met with them in June and pitched my exhibition concept, and then I received word in October that they were offering me a solo show in January 2020, which was 26 months away. A little over two years may sound like a lot of time, but I had a huge job ahead of me, a lot of plans, and a lot of unknowns. The first order of business was to find a bigger studio to accommodate my move to a much larger scale and quantity of work. My dear friend happened to be moving out of her large studio at the Alameda Artworks Complex in downtown San Jose just when I was looking. I moved in November, set up the space, ordered supplies, and hit the ground running. I began with the hanging pods since I knew they would take a lot of time between construction of the underlying forms and then covering them over with sculpted felt. I wanted to have a variety of squishinesses in the overall forms as well as surface details. I started off with plans for 21 hanging pods that I had to narrow down to 12 to fit the space at the museum, which was also good for my sanity. I chose the ones that were most intriguing and varied, and I figured out which approach to use to make them. In all cases, a coating of white wool batting, shaped and smoothed with felting needles, would be the finished surface, but I used different approaches to bulk up what was underneath. In general, I had to either stitch a pattern and fill it to create an armature, or else carve down or build up the base material. I'll show examples of each. First, the one called Curvy Planes is an example of a stitched, stuffed piece in which I made a very small paper model and then enlarged it to make the full size pattern and had it printed out on 36 inch wide paper. I used my light table to trace and cut out the pattern in freezer paper, which is waxed on one side. I rolled out my industrial felt. This tan stuff is called Eco Felt and it's from Sutherland Felt and arranged the pieces efficiently. I use freezer paper because you can iron it on, melting the wax slightly to hold it in place while you cut it out. The felt I'm using is 3 8 of an inch thick, so I use a large rotary cutter and I have to use fresh blades quite often because the felt really dulls them. I label the pieces so I can reassemble them correctly and here it doesn't matter that I've written right on the pattern because it will ultimately be covered by white wool. To stitch the pieces together I used thick waxed linen thread. It had to be done by hand because there is no machine, at least that I could find, that could handle material this thick and zigzag wide enough to really make a bite that would hold in the felt. Since felt is a non-woven textile, if I stitched too close to the edge, the thread could just pull out. I had to experiment to figure out what stitch length and spacing to use, but that's part of why I did these hanging pods first. My learning curve could be hidden and I'd have it figured out by the time I got to the holdable pieces where the stitching would be visible. You see me wearing gardening gloves as I stitch as well. That's to protect my fingers, which get really beaten up by pulling the thread tight repeatedly. When I was nearly done stitching this piece, I left one whole side open and filled it with foam rubber blocks attached to a cable and metal disc. I'll show you that shortly. And then filled the rest of the void with fiber fill. Here's the form at the end of the stitching phase. Here are some of the volunteers who helped me cover this with white wool and shape the surface, adding detail and smoothness. I'll talk more about that soon. And here's the finished piece. The next example is from a piece originally called Stacked Globes, but people kept telling me it looked like a larva or a caterpillar or a grub, and that name stuck. Grub is an example of a complex pattern that I had to figure out by making a three-dimensional model first. For that, I carved styrofoam so I'd be able to shape it easily and quickly, and then pinned fabric directly onto it as I worked out the pattern. I used a hot wire cutter to carve it, gradually removing the material I didn't want to reveal the form. Carving styrofoam with hot wire tools is very satisfying and also very slow, since you can't drag the wire through any faster than it can melt the styrofoam. It's also very toxic to breathe in the vaporized styrofoam, so I used a respirator and worked in a plasticked off area with a window and a fan whenever I couldn't work outdoors. I sanded the styrofoam in another plastic walled area in my studio because otherwise those bits get everywhere. Actually, they still get everywhere, but I kept a dedicated shop vac in the space to clean myself after each session, and I was left with a nice form to work with. To create the actual pattern, I pinned pieces of thin felt over the model and smoothed it down. Wherever the felt rippled or buckled, I trimmed it away. Then I moved on to the next piece. 
I made the pattern for only half of the model since it was to be symmetrical, and I labeled all the pieces well so I could put them back together. I took them all off the styrofoam, traced them, scanned them into my computer, smoothed them out digitally, scaled them up, and had them printed at full size. My studio assistants helped me cut out and label all 36 pattern pieces. Yes, there do exist computer programs that could probably do most of that, but I wanted to teach myself how to translate between 2D and 3D by hand and really understand it. I didn't want the over-perfection of a digitized shape, and I didn't want to spend my time in front of the computer. That's just how I'm wired, and I'm totally fine with it. When I was done stitching and stuffing, I had helpers to coat the entire form with a thick layer of wool batting. Eventually, I started adding on the sculpted detail of the rolls in between those main bulges. You can see that this piece looks really roughed out and fuzzy at this stage. Lots of needle poking later, it's getting smoother and more defined. So I've been shaping these kind of folds of flesh to make them look a little bit more believable so that there's more weight at the bottom and it looks as though the kind of globe parts of these sort of squish together. Even though this is you know, clearly a made up form, it's based loosely on real life and I like to take advantage of things like physics and gravity and try to make it look like these have a place in the world with us. Um, so because this piece is sort of hunched over, again it's got kind of these smoother, flatter areas in the back and then they come to more of a thicker point up here. And there's a lot more wool pushed in on this side, on this back side, it's a little bit more firm. So I've built up more felt here so it's squishier and you can kind of get your fingers in there and feel the folds. The whole point of this project is to get people to uh, actually encounter something new and be encouraged to touch it and to learn through touch and to connect with where they are in this moment in time and the other people who are experiencing it together. So I'm trying to make a really uh, tantalizing surfaces and shapes that people will want to touch. And here's the finished piece. You may have noticed by now that my artwork titles are really just descriptions, so you won't be surprised that this piece is called Veiny Bulb. It has some unusual surface detailing, but it's also a great example of how I carved foam rubber for the underlying form, giving this piece a very squishy feel when you hug it. I used an electric turkey carving knife to cut out foam rubber for this piece. And as you'll see, this is also an opportunity to note that I had helpers on this project from all parts of my life, including my offspring. This footage is from a day my son Alex was in the studio helping me. The foam rubber available was only about six inches thick, so I stacked up and glued rough slices of cutouts. Normally I use a tripod to film, but on this day I got some helpful feedback from my camera person. In this photo showing the glued together layers, you can see a cable sticking out of the stack on the right hand side at its top. To suspend the hanging pods, I embedded or built around a cable with a metal plate inside towards the bottom. It's meant to support and distribute the weight. The hanging pods weigh between 12 and 40 pounds, and that's not counting people leaning on them to hug. You can see in this drawing how, for the previous two types of stitched skin construction, I filled the vertical space between the metal disc and the top with blocks of foam rubber, then stuffed filler around it. In this veiny bulb piece, and another similar carved foam rubber one, I simply cut a channel through the core. Later, I covered the exposed cable up at the top by wet felting over it. Again, the electric turkey knife worked well to shape this into a bulb form in the round, and then it was a matter of covering the whole thing with wool, which gets embedded into the foam rubber when you poke into it had a lot of help for this stage. And then it was time to apply the dark brown wool for the veins with help from my studio assistant, and then to cover them over so they would be both dimensional and a bit darker than the surrounding areas. And here's the finished piece. The final hanging pod process I want to present is boxy. This one has hard planes and angles with more pliable areas between them, as if someone crammed blocks into a nylon stocking. To construct this one, I glued styrofoam blocks together around my cable and disc using expanding foam, and simply started felting over them, filling in some of the spaces between, but keeping an eye to the logic of how the skin would flow and stretch over and between the different blocks. As you now know, needle felting works by compressing the fibers in the direction you're poking. 
So for this piece, it was a matter of working on these different flat areas from each direction, and then also building up the bridges between. Yes, it takes a long time. Yes, I do spend a lot of hours alone in my studio poking at wool. But this was a group effort. So many hands worked on this piece alone over the course of many months. This process is indicative of how it went for all of the 12 hanging pods. First the wool was added over the whole surface and built up more where it was needed for shape or detail. Then the surface was laboriously evened out and smoothed, all through repetitive poking with felting needles. Thousands of hours went into the making of these interactive sculptures, and it simply would not have been possible without the volunteers and studio assistants who helped me. First I'll show you how Boxy ended up, and then I want to talk about all those helpers. I honestly don't remember when or how the idea of bringing in helpers first occurred to me or if someone else suggested it. I'm guessing it was pretty early on since I don't know how I ever would have expected to complete the work on time otherwise. The scale and quantity of sculptures that made up the 12 hanging pods were far more ambitious than anything I had attempted before. I started looking for a studio assistant to regularly help me during the week and found Jordan, an art student at Santa Clara University who brought a lot of enthusiasm for the wide variety of weird things I needed her to do. Here we ground up scraps of foam into small usable pieces for stuffing using a string trimmer in a garbage can, as one does. Another occasional studio assistant, Jessica, helped get the forms underway and ready for coating with wool. Stuffing and stitching the hanging pods closed was sometimes a three-person job. I put the word out at the Open Studios event I held in May 2018 that I was looking for people who'd want to join me in my studio poking at wool sculpture for a big project. And I got a great response. My idea was that I'd put some felting party dates on the calendar and let people know. Set up a studio, do some training, walk around felting and checking in on people's work, and provide some snacks. I figured any extra hands on deck would be a benefit, and the only real risk was trying to make sure people didn't poke themselves. I didn't anticipate how much I'd also enjoy having the energy, conversations, and insights of people of all ages, from all walks of life, and levels of art making experience. Some even had prior needle felting experience and could jump right in on details. Some volunteers came once, some came a few times, and some stuck with me through the whole year and a half of poking to come. Which is impressive, because frankly what I asked them to do was repetitive, if satisfying. While I did a lot of the really fussy detail work during the week, my weekend volunteers mostly tackled the wide open expanses of wool, refining, smoothing, and tightening the surfaces so they could be touched a lot but would stay intact. Some helpers preferred to work on particular hanging pods due to their shape, or the particular sensations of poking into the underlying armature materials of industrial felt, foam rubber, or styrofoam, which all react and sound a little different when you poke into them. And I didn't just direct helpers on how to copy models. There was still some decision making to do along the way, and a real interchange of ideas and suggestions. Needle felting is such a slow and gradual process that I had no worries about pieces dramatically going in the wrong direction. There was plenty of opportunity for course correction, and I think that was reassuring to everyone. After Jordan went back to school, I welcomed another regular studio assistant, Mercer, a recent studio art graduate who joined me for the picky final felt finishes. This piece, Orb Cluster, was one of the first that I started and the last finished, thanks to all the individual pillow blobs that had to be hand-stitched on in graduating size. I was very glad to have assistance with certain pieces in particular. Besides hanging pods, Mercer helped me with hand stitching and problem solving when it came to the next stage, making holdables. And she helped provide creative interpretations of the works in progress. Volunteers and studio assistants were crucial to the creation of the hanging pods. And here they are, finished. Besides feeling proud of them as sculptural objects, when I look at them I'm also reminded of the way my creative community turned out to be wider and deeper than I ever thought. I asked for help, and 76 people stepped up to do so many of whom I'd never met before, and many of whom have since become dear friends. One more question you may have about the hanging pods. What do they hang from? Originally, I envisioned them literally hanging from the ceiling of the venue via bolts or a hanging grid. The reality of the actual ceiling at the De Sassé Museum prevented that from being a possibility. My thoughts turned to a framework of some kind, something simple that would support the work and not distract from it. 
I wanted the hanging pods to be spaced out so the visitors would have room to move between and around them, yet at the same time, I wanted to encourage a closer encounter than what is generally welcomed in a museum. Early on, I set up some stand-ins in my studio to pace out how it would feel to move among them. I also got some feedback from studio neighbors and arrived at roughly three feet of space between the pods as a good distance. I made some sketches and an artist friend connected me with Chuck Splady from Splady Art Studios in Oakland to make it into a reality. Chuck and his team designed a simple, elegant, easy to put together and disassemble set of two steel structures that would easily hold the weight of the hanging pods and then some. He also invited me to bring my husband and sons up to the studio to see and try out some metalworking techniques. I think my kids found it a little more exciting than needle felting. The finished result of the steel structure is just what I wanted, and I think it adds to the work, providing an angular, industrial contrast to the organic pod forms. Once the hanging pods were well underway, with about a year left before the show, it was time to focus once more on the holdables. Way back at the beginning, I had started experimenting and I had a lot of plans for interesting forms. These seem pretty straightforward once they're completed in front of you, but there were a lot of challenges involved in actually making them. Once you've envisioned the form you want, you also have to decide how you want it to act, for want of a better word. The pliability or rigidity of the sculpture, whether it's concave or convex, how the pattern pieces are shaped and what order to stitch them in, are all huge things to consider. It's a lot of creative problem solving. I'll show you a few of the ways I approach the holdables. First, the mushroom is a radially symmetrical piece, so all the pattern pieces are the same. The way I manipulated the pattern after I stitched it really mattered in this case. Both the cap and stem sides fold back towards the inside, making hollow areas in the top and bottom. In this cross-section drawing, you see how I had to stitch through and attach these two cave-like areas to each other. Otherwise, the stuffing, in this case, packing peanuts and other styrofoam bits, would shift around and the negative areas could pop out to become positive areas, making a very different overall sculpture. Those concave areas are tricky if you're aiming for a squishy, pliable form. The sewn skin is very flexible, so a piece could turn out very differently depending on how and where you stuff it, and how stationary or rigid that stuffing is. In any case, this piece fits nicely on the head, in either orientation. To make a firmer sculpture that would only distort a little when a person sits on it, I started with a core of foam rubber. For this chair piece, I know, another unimaginative name, but my goal here was simply to identify them. I found a rather boring foam rubber chair and changed it. I made some big alterations and then contoured the planes using a blade. I cut out and stitched the felt layer over it, trying to use as few pattern pieces as possible to keep the design clean and streamlined. In this case, the construction was like upholstering rather than making a complicated stuffed animal. I was covering over a finished shape. I had to develop a sense of how much the foam rubber would distort as I trimmed it and stitched the pieces together for a smooth skin. Especially as I come down to the last few pieces, I'm having to cut the different edges to make sure that they all fit and I don't have too much excess when I get to the corners. You can see that this one looks like it's pretty far off, but by the time I get there, it'll be squished together a little bit. So it's a lot of stitching under tension and I'm using a curved needle so I can go in through the industrial felt, come out the other side, and just get a little bite of it to really pull it all together. I really love the swooping planes of the finished piece. I wanted to have some regular geometric shapes to contrast and balance out the organic holdables, and for those I turned to styrofoam forms. I sourced blocks of styrofoam from several places, scraps from a 3D sign and effects company, donations from a nearby packaging store, and scrounged from my neighbor's recycling. To alter and shape these forms, I could carve and sand the solid ones, or with these hollow coolers, I could cut away and then fill the empty voids with scraps of foam or expanding foam from a can. Some of these styrofoam core pieces had inset areas, but since I was again upholstering over a firm shape, I didn't have to worry about the concave areas popping out into convex shapes. The regularity and rigidity of these pieces also meant they would be easily stackable and allow for arrangements to grow vertically in the museum. This final example of holdable construction brings together both the stuffed animal-like felt skin and a rigid interior. 
I was working at home using paper to mock up some ideas, and when I folded over a letter O-like shape, my son noticed that the piece could rock from side to side. I loved the idea of a more kinetic full body experience. I made a model with the symmetry a little off for an irregular rocking motion. I figured out what the top and bottom pieces would be like and scaled it up to be big enough for people to sit or lay on. I knew with this piece I would need it to be rigid and solid, but still lightweight. And I didn't have a huge block of styrofoam to carve. Plus, I wanted the curved felt pattern to really determine the form. So my solution was to stitch the skin and then fill it with expanding spray foam. I used the kind of gaps and cracks filler you could find at the hardware store. I had to add it in layers, letting it cure and set before adding more, and filling up space with blocks of styrofoam too. This is the one product I feel like I should apologize for. The rest of my materials are relatively eco-friendly, even if it's just that I'm recycling or reusing foam that already exists and would otherwise be in a landfill. When it was full, I trimmed off the excess foam, which again, I saved to stuff inside other sculptures, and cut the top felt piece to stitch it in place. Tasks like cutting away the edge of the felt where it needs to exactly meet other surfaces may not seem like a boatload of excitement, but it's extremely difficult to trim very small increments of this thick felt accurately and neatly, so you have to do it right the first time. So many of these material wrangling techniques were new, doable, but difficult. So there was often some adrenaline involved and a lot of self-congratulation when I successfully completed the steps in the process that could mean a lot of waste of material or time if I had to redo them. Plus, it's satisfying to see things exist that started out as an idea. So here are the tangible results of the holdables idea. 47 in all at this point, although I'll admit I've made a few more since the show opened. They range in size from couch scale down to about a loaf of bread. Some are firm, some are squishy, some have no stuffing at all, and many can be worn on the head, it turns out. These are their formal studio portraits. They really come alive in dialogue with each other and visitors in the museum, as you'll soon see. When all the making was done, I again had helpers for the task of measuring, vacuuming, photographing, and bagging the finished holdables. Documenting the holdables was one of the last tasks as the date for installation approached, but throughout the whole process, photos were important for record-keeping purposes, to promote and communicate the intent of the exhibition, and to note how everything looked before being set loose among the public to be touched. Installation day arrived just before the winter holiday break in 2019. To transport the work, the museum rented a truck and we loaded it up with plastic bagged sculpture. It was disconcerting to see how quickly over two years worth of artwork could be removed from my studio and how big and empty it looked afterwards. The Desense Museum is only a 10 minute drive from my downtown studio. The museum staff includes a lot of students and we quickly unloaded into the auditorium and then into each of the two galleries. Installation itself was pretty straightforward, especially for the holdables. It was just a matter of placing the thick felt floor pieces I made and unwrapping the sculpture since it would constantly be moved around and rearranged by visitors. I also had plexiglass mirrors installed along one wall. For the hanging pods in Gallery 2, Chuck Splady and his team arrived with the steel armatures and set them up in place. We had to decide on site about the final locations and cable lengths for each hanging pod, and then over the next few days it was a matter of attending to details like finalizing lighting. I also spent some time covering over the hooks that suspend the hanging pods from the steel framework. I wrapped wool roving over and around them, then needle felted it in place to unite with the felt covering the cables. I wanted it to look like these mysterious objects had been organically bound to the man-made structure. It all seemed almost too easy, but I think that indicates all the preparation that went on beforehand. At last, everything was ready. The sculpture was in place, Invitations had gone out, hand sanitizer dispensers were installed outside each gallery, and this is even before COVID-19. It really sunk in that this was all finally happening when I saw the official signage up outside the museum. Excitement was high and it was time to welcome the human element. The opening reception of InTouch was a happy blur for me, as these things tend to be. It was incredibly well attended. In addition to my friends and family, there was a huge turnout of the volunteers and financial supporters of the project coming to see the results and celebrate. Art receptions tend to offer a very different experience of the art due to all the bodies present. For this hands-on exhibition, that meant a lot of high-energy engagement. 
which at first was a little nerve-wracking, even though I aimed to over-engineer the sculpture to make sure it was durable. That first night felt like a test, and everything held up well. I found it both gratifying and strange to see visitors getting physical with the art. That was the plan all along, of course, but I hadn't pictured quite so many people all at once, and some of the ways people interacted with my work was delightfully surprising. It was interesting to see the reactions to the art, and the reactions to the reactions to the art. The two neighboring installations felt markedly different from each other in spite of their shared touchability. The hanging pods were a somewhat familiar presentation of artworks, with the unusual option to indulge curiosity through tactile examination and hugs. The focus was on the art objects themselves. The Holdables Gallery was filled with activity. Visitors instantly understood that they could test the sculptures and explore what they felt like and how they could be arranged or worn. In this installation, the focus was more on what a participant could do with the art objects. In my subsequent visits to the show, I was always interested in observing visitors' reactions to the art and each other. The idea behind In Touch was that the experience of physically interacting with novel artworks would create a sense of connection with the art, with each other, with a feeling of wonder and being present. Reports from friends and strangers seemed to support that. From what I saw, the experience definitely seemed to vary depending on certain factors. Being solo versus visiting with a friend or in a group, whether anyone was already in the gallery engaging in a particular way with the art, and the age of the visitors, kids being much more comfortable with getting hands-on, adults feeling different degrees of inhibition and then delight at overcoming it. I think a lot of it came down to the idea of vulnerability. Do you feel trusting enough to let down your guard and interact with unusual, unfamiliar things in public? With the hanging pods, you have permission to touch objects that are vaguely body-like that can't touch back. Does that bring up anything about your own body or other people's? There's a performative and voyeuristic aspect to the holdable sculptures that put the visitor in a creative but vulnerable role. Do you feel self-conscious about doing it right? To express curiosity and openness about new experiences, objects, and people takes guts. It's easier to be cool and unaffected. The thing about vulnerability is that it means being brave and putting yourself at risk, even if it's just the risk of feeling silly. But doing that alongside other people doing the same thing is another way to break down barriers and build connections. I think In Touch provided a safe place to do that, without being obvious about it. So even with its debut unexpectedly shortened, I think In Touch has been worth it. The response to making, handling, and interacting with these big, mysterious sculptures has reinforced that there's something about the experience that people yearn for and appreciate. I know I've gotten a lot out of this project, too. I've successfully experimented with new art-making techniques. I've learned the value of community involvement in terms of both production and new relationships. I've managed all aspects of an ambitious, large-scale project, and now I know I can do it again. Together, my team has created sculptures to be proud of. And I've satisfied some of my curiosity about what would happen if I actually brought this crazy, touchable art idea to life. And it's not over. As the world comes back from social distancing, I know we'll find ways to indulge in our human desire to touch, trust, and connect. Hope may not be a plan of action, but it is a state of mind. One of my hopes going forward is that the next presentation of InTouch is something you'll get to experience in person.